I want to start with how I met him. He's um, offered to volunteer with Fish and Game. And so that's how I first came to know him. And he's a terrific person. He is very kind and he's a good listener and he gets along with people of all ages. And so he's been out working in the field with me. And then he mentioned that he, I started to find out that he's really into bugs. And then he mentioned he'd be willing to give a talk. And I thought, oh my gosh, that would be like right up our alley. And um, so I'm just super, super excited for this talk this evening. Um, he does hold a bachelor's in biology from Humboldt State and a master's in entomology from the University of Wisconsin. He, of course, is very, very interested in uh, the creepies and the crawlies and his master's thesis was on the cold tolerance of um, this invasive species of fruit fly, Drosophila suzikia. I'm probably not saying that correctly. Um, and then personally, he's of course interested in insects, but also he's very much interested in volunteering and, and integrating native plants onto the landscape and just being outside and hunting and backpacking, hiking. And so I'm very, very happy to introduce him for our talk this evening, and I'm just going to turn it over to Samuel. All right. Hey, everybody. I'm um, just going to queue up the talk. I do not have a introductory slide. I took it out, but that's fine. You guys heard enough about me just now. So introduction to goals of Southwest Idaho. Um, I originally had wanted this to be much more in depth, but as it turns out, like there's already so much to talk about this already that even with the non in depth version, I had to cut like a bunch of stuff out. So this is just going to be like scratching the surface. And I'm my intent with this talk is to kind of like line you guys up with the skills that you're going to need to like learn more about goals on your own time. So I'm like going to recommend some resources and like teach you guys the skills. So it's definitely like Going to be a good one to like take notes on if you have a piece of paper or something like that and obviously carry record these and you can always go back and watch it later but without further ado um there's going to be three parts general introduction to gulls to start off um select species of gulls of southwest idaho and honestly broader idaho in general as well as most of the western united states and sometimes all of north america um and basic techniques of cessidology so this is going to be like practical skills that you can use to study gulls in the field on your own time so part one, what are galls? And these are all galls that live in Southwest Idaho. Cecidology is the study of galls. Um, a gall is a growth made of plant tissue that is induced by the presence of a foreign organism to provide food and shelter for that organism. So a good analogy is like a wart in human beings. So a wart is basically made out of your tissue, but a wart would never form unless the virus that causes it comes into your body and causes your body to form that wart. So it's just the same thing with plants, but a lot more different types and a lot more highly specialized. So the species of the gall is always listed under the gall inducer. So like the gall itself is part of the plant, right? But the structure is specific to the animal. Usually it's an animal. Sometimes it can be other things that forms the gall. So um, for that reason, it's, it's listed under the gall inducer and there can be like different, different galls on different parts of the same plant as well as like different species of plants in the same group. Um, and sometimes closely related species can produce totally lo different looking galls on the same individual plant and same species of plant. And a great example of that is these Pachycyla galls, um, which you can find on net leaf hackberry as well as just ornamental hackberries in our area. And these are all in the same genus and the insect that forms them like the adults of each one of these three species, because these are all different species, probably all look exactly the same. But as you can see, the galls they make are drastically different, even on the same plant. So gall inducers are usually pretty specialized in the scope of plants that they can develop on. Um, usually it's just one species or like a few different species in the same genus. Um, I don't really think I know of any galls that are on different genera of plants, but I'm sure it probably exists in some example. Um, the structure of galls varies widely, but in general, you're gonna have a hardened exterior 
surrounding one or more inner chambers where that animal, usually an insect, is feeding on the inside of the gall. So it's, it's eating the plant tissue, basically. Um, and so a lot of times the galls will have like special nutritive cells on the inside that are like more packed with nutrients than an average parenchyma cell in a plant. And a lot of times those cells will only form in the gall. Um, and the galls can form in any part of the plant, including weird places like the roots, but most of the time they're going to be on the leaves, the stem, the buds, or even the flowers. So the exact like molecular mechanisms of gall formation aren't well understood, but it's evolved across so many different groups, like even it's basically evolved across like all the major groups of life. Um, so like there's probably a lot of variation in how this relationship works, but in general, at least with insect galls, it's the feeding activity of the larval insects. So it's secreting things as it's chomping down on the inside of the plant. And that's gonna actually cause the plant to make that gall. So this is just an example. You see there's an adult gall midge here that lays an egg, the egg hatches, it turns into a larva. The larva starts feeding. And as the larva feeds, the secretions that it makes causes the plant to form a gall. Eventually that larvae is gonna grow up to be pretty big with a full mature gall around it. It's gonna pupate into an adult and go start the process all over again. So what creates galls in terms of like what animals or you know, fungi or whatever? So galls are similar to lichens in that they describe a way of life, not a unified group of organisms. So a gall is just a term for a structure that's induced by another foreign organism on a plant. Although there's actually animal galls too, um, very little known fact, but like the crinoids, especially in the fossil record, have other animals that form galls on them, but not really relevant to your average nature walk. But most gall inducers are animals, specifically arthropods, but there are galls that are created by fungi, bacteria, and other plants, some mistletoes, and those are like the witch's brooms. Um, there's some like arbitrariness in whether or not you call that a gall, but some people do. So since most of the gall inducers are insects, we're gonna have to talk a little bit about insect development. Um, insects go through two basic types of development across different groups of insects, complete metamorphosis, and that's gonna be like your butterfly type life cycle. So starting out as this like squishy little caterpillar type thing, turning into a little like packet of pupae, which is like developing into its adult form, and eventually as an adult with wings like a butterfly. And then there's gonna be incomplete metamorphosis where the, oops, the um, immatures look like the adults, but they don't have wings or reproductive parts. So like think a grasshopper. So here's some visual examples of that. Um, this is the same gall midge I used before. As you can see, it starts out as this little white fleshy larvae, it turns into a pupae, and then into a winged adult versus this silid over here that starts out as a small six-legged insectoid and then turns into a big six-legged insectoid that can reproduce and has wings. So galls are almost always inhabited by the immature stage of an insect. Pretty much it's never gonna be the adult, it's gonna be either the pupae or the larvae. And you can actually use what type of development the gall maker has to start figuring out what creates an individual gall because certain types of insects are always gonna have a certain type of development. So insects with complete metamorphosis are gonna have like a worm or caterpillar like thing inside the gall versus things that have incomplete metamorphosis are going to have a six-legged, recognizably insectoid thing inside the goal. So I'm going to go through all of these and explain them to you and explain at least tangentially how to identify them inside a gall as an immature. So um, yeah, starting from the top, we're going to have gall midges. And full disclosure, these are my favorite group of gall forming creatures. So it's going to be a little bit longer and I'm a little bit biased. But these guys are really cool. Um, they're true flies in the order Diptera, which includes some recognizable things like mosquitoes and crane flies, which all have that complete development. So little squishy larva, pupae, adult. Um, about 7,000 species are known right now, but the actual number is absolutely much, much higher than that. Um, some people think that these are actually like the most diverse group of animals alive. But whether they are or not, there's definitely a ton of them out there. And there's plenty of undescribed species of these right here in Idaho. They are the most common as well as diverse group of galling organisms in our area, as well as a lot of areas. 
So golf formation in these groups is typically induced by the larvae with the adults laying eggs in or on the host plant. So that's pretty typical. Um, they attack a pretty wide variety of plant species in our area. Um, Salicaceae and Asteraceae are going to have the most species of these guys. So this is just once again showing that life cycle. Um, so getting into the identification of the Cicidomyids or the gall midges. Um, the larvae are legless, eyeless, and often appear headless. They do have a head, but it's small and it's often retracted into the body and it can be hard to see without a dissecting scope, but this is what the larvae look like. So this is what you're going to see when you crack open a gall midge gall. Um, the easiest way to identify this group is that the larvae are distinctly orange colored, like bright orange like this. And most of the gall midge larvae in our area are like this. And um, so if you see something in a gall that's orange, it's always going to be a gall midge, but not all gall midges are orange. There are some that are that kind of pale white color. So in that situation, there's another character called the spatula, which is a tiny little hardened plate at the head. Um, only mature larvae have this and not every single species does. So it's not a perfect character, but once again, only gall midges have this. So if it's orange and, or if it has a spatula, that's how you know it's a gall midge once you crack open that gall. Not all these guys are gall formers. Only the members of the biggest subfamily, Cicidomyini, are. Um, some of these other guys might feed on fungi, be predatory, parasitic, or generally unspecialized herbivores. They're just super cool and they do whatever they want to do. Some members are significant as pests, most famously the Hessian fly which is a pest of wheat that in the past caused huge losses in wheat crops. Um, it's not as much of a problem today. And most of these aren't pests, but a couple are. Um, really cool fact, they're one of the few known animals, the other being aphids and some mites, that can make their own carotenoids. So carotenoids are the chemicals that make a lot of things orange, like carrots and changing colors, leaves and falls, and they're necessary nutrients for most all probably all animals as far as I know but uh, most animals cannot manufacture their own they have to get it from their diet and even cooler those genes were originally obtained from fungi in a lateral gene transfer event in the evolutionary history of the gall midges which I think is pretty awesome moving on to the next group we're going to be talking about the tephridae or the tephridid fruit flies and I just call them tephridids it's a lot easier a lot of these guys have really picturesque wings as adults. So if you ever see a fly with pretty wings, it, it might just be a tephridid. They are also in the order Diptera, just like gall midges, as well as mosquitoes and houseflies. They have complete development, so larvae, pupae, adult. Um, most of these guys aren't gall formers. Most of them just are generally herbivorous and feed on plants without forming a gall. And once again, a lot of the adults have pattern pretty wings. Um, despite the fact that relatively few species of tephridids are gall formers, those that are can be very common in our area, and we'll go over that later. Um, our local tephridid galls tend to mostly be on Asteraceae, especially sagebrush and rabbitbrush. And I just say mostly because, you know, I, I'm not word of God. I don't know everything. But as far as I know, we only have tephridid galls on these two plants. But that doesn't mean that there isn't any that exist in our area, any else that exists. So for identification, larvae are often soft, pale whitish, and kind of pill-shaped. This is one right here. Um, no obvious head, not orange like a gall midge. So it looks a little bit like a gall midge larvae. Often it's a little bit more like oval shaped, whereas gall midge larvae are kind of like a little bit more squarish, I guess, but not all the time. Once again, never going to be orange, never going to have a spatula. Usually these will be bigger. The larvae will be bigger in the gall than a gall midge too. Gall midges are pretty small. Um, they often spend a lot of time in the gall as pupae, and their pupae light are like this. They're of the puparium type, where it's the last molted skin of the larvae that forms the shell of the pupae, and it looks just like this, just like a little, um, just like a little nugget. So if it has a puparium that looks like this inside of it, it's probably a tephridid gall. So moving on the, to the cynipidae or the gall wasps. Um, so um, this is a cynipid right here. They're really, really tiny. This is probably like two millimeters long. This is our most common cynipid gall. You've probably seen it before on the green bells or something. Um, in the order Hymenoptera, which also includes ants, bees, and wasps, which all have that complete development. 
they're widely distributed and globally pretty significant group of gall formers and all of these do form galls as far as I know. Um, however, they're not really that common or important locally in the southwest Idaho area. And part of that is that at least in North America, these guys are pretty closely associated with oaks. And, um, you know, there's not a lot of oaks around here. And the ones that do form around oaks are some of the like coolest looking galls, you know, subjectively, but you'll probably agree. And I decided to throw some on there, even though these probably don't occur in our area. And this is, this is from a book. I didn't take any of these pictures. Um, but yeah, you can see they're just absolutely insane looking. These are all cynipid galls on oaks. Some of them secrete stuff that ants like to feed on. Uh, it's absolutely insane. But since oaks aren't really that big a thing in Southwest Idaho, and you know, I know this is the Idaho Native Plant Society, so I might bite my tongue, but I don't think there's any native species of oaks in Idaho, but please correct me later if I'm wrong. Either way, like oaks are definitely not that common in the natural landscape of Idaho. Um, of course, there are ornamental oaks, and some of those might have like these oak apple galls, which are caused by gall wasps. In terms of the gall wasps that we have that are common in like the natural landscape of Idaho, a lot of them are on roses and are formed by the genus Diplolepis. And here's a couple examples of that. We'll go over that more later. So identification, larvae are pale white, legless, often C-shaped. They have a recognizable head, although it's fairly undifferentiated from the rest of the body, but you can recognize that head by the mandibles, which are usually hardened and dark colored. Um, the larvae are similar looking to some other gall forming wasp groups and parasitoids. So it's especially important to make sure that you know what gall it is from the morphology of the gall itself, in addition to seeing the larvae with these guys, because a lot of wasps are parasitoids and um, also form other types of galls. Moving on to the tenthrodinity or the common sawflies. Here's an example of those and some of their galls. Also in the Ormer hymen, order Hymenoptera, um, most of them are not gall formers. They are generally broadly herbivorous. Um, the adults kind of look like chunky, sort of squarish wasps, as you can see here. Um, they're sort of anomalous in that the gall formation is induced by the female laying eggs on the host plant rather than the feeding activity of the larvae. And a lot of our local species are on willows. So identification, the larvae look a lot like caterpillars, but they have more legs on each segment. Um, the galls are often filled with frass, which is this kind of granulated insect poop, which you can see that here, this sort of brown, chunky looking stuff. Um, and that's gonna be pretty distinct to sawfly galls in our area. Moving on to aphylaridae or the aphylarid siloids. Um, these guys are our hackberry gallers. They're in the order Hemiptera, which includes a lot of recognizable things like aphids and cicadas and bed bugs, which this is our first group with incomplete development. So the babies look more or less like the adults. They're not like a caterpillar kind of thing. They used to be in the family Psylidae, which has now been split up in the last, I think, five or six years into a bunch of different families, one of which is Aphylaridae. So these aren't Psylids. Don't call them that. Although the Psylidae is in the common name of a lot of these goals, so <laughs> it's a little, little behind the times in that regard. But um, all our galling species are in the genus Pachycyla, which is a specialist on hackberry. Um, other members of the family are generalist plant feeders. One really cool thing that's not in our area, but just kind of a general cool thing to know about is that some of these guys do form these skins called lerps, which um, have a similar function to gall. But instead of being created from plant tissue, lerps are actually formed from crystallized honeydew, which is a kind of excrement formed by some insects because they, they, they feed on the phloem and they're getting too much sugar. So they excrete it. And these guys actually build houses out of it. So um, a lot of these form on eucalyptus and stuff like that. And a lot of other plants that don't really, aren't really planted a lot in their area. So for identification, if it's a gall on hackberry and has something that looks like this or this, you know, it's going to have little wing pads and six legs, sometimes red eyes, then it's probably an aphylarid gall. Moving on to the aphidity or the aphids. Some examples of aphid galls. 
These guys are also in the order Hemiptera, just like Apollarids are. Um, they're aphids, so you probably already know what they look like, especially if you're into plants. Um, the galls are often filled with waxy secretions, so you can see this kind of like waxy stuff right here. A lot of times those are actually on the aphids' bodies, as well as honeydew. Um, these little balls are little balls of honeydew, so sugar water, basically. They don't use it to build a house like some of those apollards do, so it's not as cool. Um, aphid nymphs may look a little bit similar to apollards, but in our area, aphids will mostly be on poplars and cottonwoods and aspen, and apollards will be on hackberry. Um, I don't know of any aphid dolls on hackberry, so that should be pretty reliable. They also tend to be really densely packed into their galls, and lots of species are not gallers. Lots of them just feed on plants, which I'm sure you've noticed. So I'm going to quickly talk about this family, Adelgidae. Uh, they're a close relative of the aphids, and they look just like aphids, but they attack conifers, and some species do form galls. Um, I don't know of any records of this species, Adelgis culiae, but it attacks Douglas fir and spruces. Um, here's an example of a gall on spruce. This is one of several aphids and adelgids that switches between a galling and non-galling life cycle. And since you know Douglas firs and spruces are in the area, I suspect that this probably lives here too, but I've never seen it personally. Not gonna talk about these anymore after this. So our last major group of gall formers, the Areophyidae or the gall mites. Um, these are arachnids not insects, they have two legs versus like the eight, which is what they teach you in school that you know all arachnids have. They're very, very small. Um, they're similar to bees and wasps, not exactly the same, but similar in that unfertilized females produce only males while fertilized females produce both, produce both males and females. They're pretty diverse worldwide with around 4,000 species described. And just like the gall midges, that's probably just a tiny slice of what's actually out there. They're also pretty diverse in our area. And a lot of the other gall groups I talked about in our area tend to be restricted to at least like one or two families of plants. But these guys seem to attack a much wider variety. Um, unfortunately, I'm not gonna be able to talk about these guys very much. I think I only have one gall in this talk of gall mites. But identification, the in my experience anyway, the galls tend to appear empty. And I think that's just because the mites are so tiny that you can't see them with your naked eye. So if you crack a gall open and it looks like there's nothing in it, it's probably a gall mite gall. Um, identification, this isn't like a hard or fast rule by any means, it's just kind of a trend I've noticed, but a lot of mite galls tend to have this kind of like knobby or crusty appearance that you can see in some of these examples down here in the bottom. And not gonna talk about any of these galls, unfortunately, but all three of these galls are found in Southwest Idaho. The middle one's on maple. I think the left one is on prunus, but I could be wrong. So other gall residents, parasitoids and inguines, really important aspect of the gall community. Um, parasitoids are an animal, usually an insect, that develops within the body of another animal and eventually kills it. Compare that to a parasit parasite, which doesn't kill its host, and a predator, which doesn't live inside the thing it kills. And this is a parasitoid wasp that I reared out from a gall. Some gall on rabbit brush. Don't, don't remember which gall at the top of my head, but that was, that was from Idaho too. In our area, the grand majority of gall parasitoids will be wasps. Um, they can be found attacking any of the gall deucer groups except the mites, as far as I know, because they're much too small. Um, they're often seen as like little tiny brown pupae. Oftentimes the pupae would be a little bit translucent with a mostly developed wasp sitting inside the gall. But there's all different kinds of them. Some of them act kind of like ticks. And here's an example of that. There's actually a wasp larvae here, like on the outside of this gall midge feeding on its blood. <laughs> this, these platygastrids actually specialize on gall midges. So uh, there's a lot of co-evolution and stuff going on in, this, in these parasitoids. Parasitoid densities can be pretty high in a gall population. Like I would estimate certain ones I've seen that can even get up to like 50% of the galls will have parasitoids rather than the gall former inside of them. Um, and keep in mind that they, as pupae do look a little bit like gall wasps. So it might be hard as an amateur to tell those guys apart. So when in doubt, maybe post a picture online or send me a picture or something like that and I might be able to help you out. Inkleens are, in my opinion, one of the coolest aspect of gall communities. And they're animals that live in the nest but don't cause the gall former a lot of harm. Um, a parallel could be like a cockroach or a silverfish. 
that lives in your house but doesn't really like cause you much harm i mean some people might think they do but really like a silverfish or a cockroach it's it's not like trying to eat you or anything like that you know <laughs> um this is an example of an inkling right here where this is the thing that formed the gall and this is a gall midge that is an inkling inside the gall that this thing formed so a lot of time inklings are members of gall forming lineages that have secondarily evolved a inkling lifestyle but they can also be like moths beetles sawflies um just like an insane variety of different things can be inklings and this does make identifying what's in a gall a little bit harder because it can be one of these random things. Uh, we'll talk about how to deal with that later. And this, this is absolutely an amazing aspect of gall, gall biology, but some gall formers actually form galls on already existing galls. So it's basically gallception. And I've never seen one of these in person, but this gall is a tephritic gall that lives in our area. It's on rubber rabbit brush. It's super common. Um, and it has an endogall that's formed by a gall midge. So it's this little knobby thing right here. Apparently this endogall actually can kill the tephritid sometimes when the endogall gets too big. But yeah, just crazy stuff. Um, and just as a general side note, effect on hosts, you know, there's so many gall host interactions that you can't make generalizations, but Generally, the galls don't cause their hosts a ton of harm. It's kind of like, you know, you can have a bunch of mosquitoes feed on you, and as long as they don't give you a disease, it's really not going to cause you any problems long term. Like, you have plenty of blood to give. <laughs> it's the same thing with a lot of these plants. Um, a lot of these plants support like huge loads of gall formers without really having any apparent negative effects. Uh. Part two, select galls of Southwest Idaho. A little bit of terminology, real simple. Monothalamus has a single chamber versus polythalamus has multiple chambers. Here's an example of a monothalamus gall, Pachycyla. You can see there's just one of these guys per gall versus polythalamus. You can see there's one chamber with one individual here versus another one here, all in the same gall. So, <laughs> The naming of galls is a little messy. Um, a lot of the common names aren't standardized. I took my common names from either this book, which I'll introduce later, or iNaturalist. Um, generally, it's better to use scientific names like with most things. But unfortunately, since so many of these gall species are undescribed, you have to use common names occasionally. <laughs> so it can be good to know both the Latin and the common names, as intimidating as that can be. So botanical scope, this is the part that you guys are already familiar with. Um, galls form on a pretty wide array of plants. However, woody perennial trees and shrubs are generally going to have the most species of galls. Um, in terms of plant families in our area, the Asteraceae and Salicaceae have probably the most diverse assemblages of galls. Not necessarily true worldwide, though. So <laughs> this is... <laughs> This is a very cut down version of what I want to talk about, but we're going to focus on some of the very common and major plants that have a lot of obvious skulls on them in our area. And this is just a little warning about that. I, you know, I had to cut out 60% of the galls. Um, that original scope was just a tiny fraction of galls in our area, and now it's even smaller. So this is nowhere near covering any, everything in Southwest Idaho. Starting off strong with Rhabdophagia rigidi. This is a real common gall on willows um, and can be found on a bunch of different species. I'm not entirely sure which species this is. This was near Hidden Springs in a riparian area. But this like beak thing right here, it's not a new shoot. It's like a very distinct, almost like horn coming off of the gall is really distinct and will reliably identify this gall apart from other stem galls on willow, which can look similar. Um, and, and just to introduce this format up here, this is always going to tell you the host, the galler, and where the gall is forming on the plant. Um, young galls are often more green and smooth. Older are like the adjacent image, so they're wrinkly. They tend to turn kind of reddish and have you know more of like a hard bark texture. And it's a monothalamus gall, so if you cut it open, it'll have a single chamber with a gall midge pp or larvae inside. Another really distinct gall on willow is Rhabdophagus stroboides, the willow pine cone gall midge, and it is called that for good reason because the galls look just like pine cones in a not example of conversion evolution because this is a gall, not a 
reproductive structure like a actual pine cone is. Um, very common gall. I suspect you guys have probably seen them before. Um, very widespread, as you can see, this is the same species. I took this picture from northern Wisconsin, um, but they're everywhere, you know, see them along the green belt and stuff. A lot of time there'll be a lot of inquilines hiding out in the scales, the cone scales, so to speak. <laughs> Um, so try pulling some of these apart. They can be, they can have some really cool stuff inside. Rhabdophagia, Salissa brassicoides, the willow rosette gall midge, another really common and widespread gall on willow. It's fairly similar looking to the pine cone gall, but it has like longer leafier bracts versus this one. The bracts are like very short, very tightly oppressed to the gall. Here they're a lot longer and looser. This also lives on several species of willow and also has a very broad distribution all the way to the East Coast and um, Northern Canada. This is what they look like when they get old, just a little bit less leafy and ragged, but still much more leafy looking than the pine cone gall. And this is a polythalamus gall. So Pontania species, these are gonna be your willow, apple, gall, sawflies. Um, they're a big species complex and the taxonomy is not there, uh, especially in Idaho, but they are very common. You can crack them open and see this little sawfly larvae inside with all the frass. Um, they're all monothalamus as far as I know, so it's gonna be one sawfly per gall. Um, I don't know how many species are in the area. I don't think there's a lot of resources for identifying them to species. It's likely that some or most of them, maybe even all of them are undescribed around here. These are all from Idaho, um, various parts. The species groups can be determined by gall structure, but this won't necessarily get you to the actual species. But most of our species tend to be in the Pontania viminalis group, which do these really thin walled galls on the underside of leaves on willows. So getting into some of the awesome, just messy vagueness of galls, here's a completely unidentified, probably undescribed gall that I found this summer um, southwest of Cascade in Valley County. Um, I'm, I'm sure you guys have probably heard of and or been to Blue Lake, but there's a bunch of these galls on willows there. And I thought it was a midge gall because there's a gall on willow that looks like this that is formed by midges. However, when I actually dissected it out, two of them were filled with parasitoids, but one of them had a sawfly in it. And I was like, okay, maybe it could just be an inquilin, but the other two with parasitoids also had that granulated frass, so that brown squarish poop. Um, so if you guys see any of these galls with this weird like paired horn structure, especially around Blue Lake, like please dissect them out and try to rear them out and see what you find. Because I'm very curious to see what call caused this gall then. Um, yeah, this is an example of the kind of detective work sometimes you have to do trying to understand what makes a gall. So moving on to poplars now. Um, this is a group of aphids that form all types of galls on poplars, you know, all types, you know, from aspens to cottonwoods to pretty much anything in the genus populus. Um, there's a bunch of different species, but these two, Pemphigus populocollis and Pemphigus popular transversus are probably the most common in Idaho. Um, they create these woody kind of subspherical galls at the leaf petiole junction on a lot of different species. And the way you identify this one, populocollis, is that it has a spiral opening for the aphids to come in and out of versus this one, popular transversus, which I don't have a picture of, has a straight opening. You can hopefully kind of imagine what that looks like. This is another really common one. Um, Popular viney, it induces these kind of warty, bulgy swellings on leaves. Um, you can see these on cottonwoods a lot around the green belt. A lot of times the galled leaves will fall to the ground first. So sometimes in fall, you have to look on the ground instead of the actual plant. Moving on to the Cambinaceae. These are our famous quote unquote silids, actually aphylarids now um, in the genus Pachycyla. And we've got three species that I've seen um, two of them are for sure on net leaf hackberry. The Pachycyla venusta induces these woody galls on the petioles of leaves versus Pachycyla pellita induces this kind of hairy little wart on the stem of leaves. Um, Pachycyla seltum desmama is probably the most like apparent and common gall on hackberry caused by these guys. 
I'm actually not 100% sure if this forms on Netleaf Hackberry or if it's just the ornamental ones that it grows on. It's definitely on the ornamentals, but maybe you guys can confirm that. But these two, definitely on Netleaf Hackberry. So if you want to see some cool exotic Hackberry galls, go out and find yourself some of that. Moving on to roses and gall wasps. Diplolepis rosy, the mossy rose gall wasp is one of our biggest and most obvious and most common galls. Um, it's on dog rose and other European roses. You can identify it by that big fuzzy appearance. Um, the galls form in summer and the adults come out in spring. There's another one on native rose that looks really similar, but it's gonna be on native rose instead of an invasive rose. So here's where your plant tax knowledge is gonna come in handy with galling. We also have some other Diplolepis galls, and you know a lot of these are going to be undescribed too. Not quite as much as with the midges, but um, you know they have a more diverse range of forms. They can be a little bit more spiny versus hairy. So moving on to everyone's icon of the Great Basin, Artemisia tridentata. Um, you treated Diana. This is a tephritid gall. It doesn't have a common name. I just made this up. Sagebrush stem stem gall tephritid. Um, this is probably our most common gall on sagebrush, and it looks kind of like a quintessential gall. It's a, it's a stem gall, so it's going to be like a little round swelling. A lot of times it'll have leaves sticking out of the tip. Um, older ones, the leaves often fall out and look kind of like this. Moving on to a, another common one. This is going to be a Ropalamaya medusa, the sagebrush sponge gall. And it just looks like this little ball of leaves. It looks, it's a little bit like the wasp call on roses. And uh, when they're young, these are bright green. Even they stand out a lot of times from the kind of bluish green of the sagebrush and they turn brown when they're older. Another really, really common one, Rapalium iapomium, the sagebrush sponge gall. So if the other guy, the tephritid, isn't our most common gall on sagebrush, this probably is. The texture is always gonna be spongy or foam-like and never hard or woody. If it is hard or woody and it looks like this, it's probably a different kind of gall. The structure can actually be affected by parasitoids. So the lumpier the galls are, the generally the more parasitoids it has. Another tephritid gall, Acerina biglovii, the cotton gall tephritid. And this is gonna be on rubber rabbit brush. So now we're moving past the sagebrush. Um, this is a monothalamus gall, which is the case for most tephritids. Here's the adult, it's pretty attractive looking. Acerinotrixa, this is the one that has those endogalls and they call it the bubble gall tephritid. Uh, sorry for the picture quality here, but it's pretty much just like a little circular swelling on the stem of rubber rabbit brush. This is another really common one. It tends to help to kind of look in the middle of the plant with these guys. For some reason, they tend to form a little further down the stem. Um, they're monothalamus like most tephritid galls. This is a really interesting one because this is an undescribed species of Rapalamaya, so gall midge. That's um, super common in our area. So it kind of looks like a cabbage head, but with cotton in the middle of it. Um, when they're young, they have these large bracts, but these are often broken off in older galls. This is a polythalamus gall. So underneath the cotton is a bunch of little cells that have midges in it. Here's a larvae. Um, you can kind of see the translucent cell with that kind of orange that's a larvae underneath this one right here. And to distinguish it from that cotton gall tephritid that I just mentioned, the cotton gall tephritid is basically like sessile, so it doesn't have a little stalk versus this one cotton gall flower midge. It, it's actually forming from a flower, so it does have a stalk in addition to that kind of bract at the bottom, which the, the cotton gall tephritid does not have. So moving on to goldenrod galls now. Um, Astromaya species. These guys are probably some of our least gall looking galls. Um, they look kind of just like little circular blisters. Sometimes they are a little bit swollen, but sometimes they're just about as like thick as the leaf is. Um, if you're in doubt whether it's one of these guys' galls or like, you know, a fungus or something like that, just crack it open and there should be a little orange midge inside or you can often see an exit hole if it's a mature gall from when the adult midge comes out and flies away. So this one of these other just insane aspects of gall biology, but most Astromaya galls are ambrosia galls, which is where the gall inducer has a relationship with a species of fungi, which the gall inducer will actually 
introduce into the gall with it when it forms a gall. And that fungi grows inside the gall. And in certain midges, the larvae will feed on the fungi. But in this case, the larvae, it actually like forms kind of a hardened shell around the inside of the gall. And like, cause no one studies this and no one knows what that does, but people theorize that it might be to protect against parasitoids. Um, so that black stuff in this picture, that's the fungal mycelium inside the gall of this astromaya. So last but not least for our little walk through some of our native galls, um, a non-native gall, Asteria chondrilli, the skeleton weed gall mite. Um, this is on every, sorry, I keep doing that. This is on everyone's least favorite plant, the rush skeleton weed. And people actually use this thing as biocontrol. So this gall mite um, will go in and take over the flower heads of rush skeleton weed and prevent them from reproducing. <laughs> And it will stress out the plant a little bit, but clearly they're not that good at their job because this, if you start looking for it, this gall mite is pretty common and uh, so is rush skeleton weed, as I'm sure all of you are well aware of. Moving on to our last section, the basic techniques of cessetology. So these are some knowledge and skills that are going to show you how to go out and become your own gall master. <laughs> The great unknown. So there is so much to be learned about galls. Um, it's not quite like plants where, you know, there's so much to be learned about plants too, but like most of the species of plants are described in Idaho, right? I would say that probably like half of our galls are undescribed. And um, like, especially in this state, there's nobody working on them at all, unless you count me, which you shouldn't, because I'm not doing anything in terms of papers right now on these guys. But if you start to have some of your own knowledge, like you can really start to add new information to the body of knowledge of science with these guys, just because the, just because we've really only scratched the surface with what we know about goals, even just on the level of basic species descriptions. So I'm gonna train you to be your own cessetologist because some of these goals you find, no one might be able to tell you anything about them. So you're gonna have to be able to teach yourself stuff. So galling in the field. So let's say you're going out looking for birds or plants. You're in the sagebrush step and you see a great basin sagebrush. So I like to start at the very tip at the leaves, look really close at the texture of the leaves on both sides, see if there's any swellings, bulges, you know, galls can take so many shapes and forms. Sometimes they look just like little blisters. Sometimes there's large, sometimes they're small. And then just keep moving down the stem, keeping an eye out for any kind of irregularities. Um, make sure buds. Make sure that you look at the base of the stem all the way up to the tip. And especially for you guys that are probably going to be doing stuff with plants, also when you're in the field and digging holes and stuff like that, like look at roots and, and things like that and see if you see any galls on the roots and all those other parts of the plants that people don't look at as often because, you know, that might be one of the few opportunities that anyone's going to notice something like that. And try to always look at multiple individuals of the same species of plant because for whatever reason, sometimes it'll be like one, like there's one sagebrush here that has no galls on it. And then there's one sitting right next to it that has like a hundred galls on it. And uh, I feel like that probably has something to do with just randomness of a, you know, a tephritted fly coming in and laying eggs on that individual. But it helps to look at a bunch of the same species when you're looking for galls. When you find a gall that you've never seen before, the first thing you do is cut it open and see what's inside. So if the gall is really soft, so like one of those astromaya leaf galls, it's just a little blister on a leaf, basically. You can just do that with your fingers because they're so soft. But with certain other galls, you're going to need to cut them open with a knife. And there's a little bit of a technique to that. Um, first of all, just be safe and don't cut yourself. Like I like to put it on a rock or a root or something like that. And just like very, you know, with force, because they are, some of these goals are very, very hard and woody, um, just like, you know, just like the stem of an actual woody plant. And um, just very gently make an excision. Don't cut straight through it, because if you do, you might cut the gall inducer in half, and you might not be able to figure out what it is after that. And after you've made a little incision, try to pull it apart if you can. If not, just kind of keep working around until you can kind of like cut it in half, like this uh, hackberry gall. You can see it's kind of a really clean cut right there. And I, God, I keep doing that, sorry. <laughs> I managed not to cut the athelards inside in half. And if you do have a hand lens or dissecting scope, those are super helpful for 
being able to look at what's inside of the goals. Because once again, some of these golf formers are super small. So collecting and rearing, this is a really accessible and really fun part of cestodology. Um, anyone can do this. It can be challenging and getting it right requires a lot of challenge, trial and error, but the basic setup is super simple. And this is a Astro Maya goal from uh, Goldenrod from Wisconsin that I reared out. So you can see all the pupae shells sitting on it. And this is the adult midge that eventually came out. And this, this thing's probably like two millimeters long. So it's super tiny. Um, and before I talk more about this, just a little disclaimer. I'm sure lots of you guys are very conservation minded already, but just don't forget that these are living organisms. Um, you know, a lot of times the plants that they're on aren't always doing the best in their native range. So just trying not to go like completely insane, like going out and collecting like 100 goals or something like that. I try to collect around five or six, like maybe I'll dissect open three or something like that and then take three back to rear. But if there's only like one of a goal in an area, then I'll usually try not to collect it just to make sure I don't impact the species um, in a you know, significant way. So the best time to go out collecting galls for rearing is usually spring or fall, but it does depend on the species. Um, you can try to look it up. Some of these, some of these different groups, especially like a really common one, like the some of the willow gall midges will have other people have done this and you can already know what time the adults come out from the goal, but most of the time you're just gonna have to figure it out. In terms of like physically where to start, literally anywhere, goals are everywhere. But if you're looking for something easy to start out with, I would go for some sagebrush, rabbit brush or willows because those have some really common and obvious goals and they're everywhere. And uh, once again, I just like to collect two or three to rear. So this is the basic setup. Um, really, all you need to do is just get a Tupperware and you know try to line it with some paper or cotton at the bottom. Um, always put a label in the bottom of your rearing Tupperware. Just you know, you don't want to come back a month later and be like, "Oh, what plant did I get this off? Or where did I find it? Or when did I collect it from?" Because then your rearing project will be scientifically useless. <laughs> I guess you can, you don't have to label it if you're just doing it for fun, but still you should. Um, and I like to put a little bit of cotton or paper in the bottom, partially just because when the gall former does come out, it can make it easier to see, as well as it saps up a little moisture so that mold doesn't form. Um, so yeah, just real simple, just get a Tupperware um, with a nice well sealing lid and that's really all you need. Um, different species may have different environmental requirements to have the adult gall former come out, but I try to keep mine in contact with natural light since a lot of insects life cycles are pretty heavily regulated by like changing seasons and the light dark cycles. Um, some also will require cold shock so you can try keeping them outside or in the fridge and just play around and see what works so, you know if you try to rear out a gall at one time of the year try rearing it out at a different time if you Rear it out over winter and it, nothing came out, try putting it in the fridge, you know, there's all kinds of things you can try to get this to work. You should try to check the bottoms of your rearing container about once a week. Um, I definitely don't, but I should, because <laughs> you don't want the thing coming out and getting like moldy or falling apart or something like that. Um, and just so you know, parasitoids are often a lot easier to rear out than the gallers themselves. Uh, a lot of times they'll come out way before the adults would. And um, sometimes you can get a ton of them, the little parasitoids. So you'll see them as these little tiny, usually dark color wasps sitting on the bottom of the container. And remember just a lot of these animals are super small. So don't like pop open your gall container and you don't see anything at first and then just throw it out. Like make sure that you really look closely in the bottom because the gall formers can sometimes not be that easy to see. And you know, a hand lens can come in handy there, especially if you're a little harder of hearing or of sight. So in my experience, midge and tephritic galls are usually pretty easy to rear out versus gall wasps and sawflies are a little harder. Um, but you know, really go for whatever gall interests you. But if you are, you know, just trying to get a really easy rearing starting project in, you know, maybe go for one of those gall, um, one of those midge galls on willow. Those are usually pretty easy. Um, before you open your container to check what's inside, make sure there's nothing flying around inside. <laughs> That's a mistake I've made before and I don't want you to make. 
don't be discouraged if you don't get anything emerging out. That's part of the process. Um, I'd say only about 25% of my rearing attempts are successful. And don't give up too quick because sometimes these goals, the rear, the insect will sit inside for, you know, an entire year or more. So let it, let it sit there for a while before you get rid of it. And this is probably going to be too much for most people. It's even a little too much for me at times, but you can make your own like gall collection. This isn't like a thing that people do. This is just something that I've done, but you could do it too if you want. Um, what I do is I just dry out the galls with some, um, I think they call it dry right or something like that. But you can find drying beads and I just put that in the bottom of the Tupperware and put the gall in and make sure that it dries out and leave it there for a few weeks so it doesn't get moldy and fall apart. And then, then I just put the gall former in a little vial with a uh, 75% ethanol and um, isopropyl alcohol will probably work okay too. And then I just put a label on for both. So the, the advantage of this is that if you want to come back and see what you reared out years in the future, then you have the gall in the thing you reared out of it in one place together and you can directly compare. And you can also like pin a lot of these things like pinning insects as well as slide mount them. But the techniques for that are a little bit too involved to speak of now. Um, if you're interested, maybe shoot me an email and I can point you right in the right direction of getting started with some of that stuff. So yeah, that's that's it. Um, here's some resources to start learning and teaching yourself more about goals. Um, first of all, there's me, I'm a resource. Don't hesitate to shoot me an email, shoot me a picture of goals or just insects in general. Um, especially if you like are into rearing goals now or like trying to identify something that you cut out from a goal, I, I can definitely help out with that. Uh, I'm, you know, I don't know everything. I'm not gonna be able to, tell you like the species of every insect just by looking at a picture, but I'll do my best. And also I'm naturalist, which I'm sure a lot of you guys are familiar with, but I actually started this goals of Southwest Idaho projects back in spring when I told Carrie I was gonna be giving this talk. So any goal observation you make on naturalist will go into this project anyway, but it's also a good thing to look up and be able to see some of our common goals and where people have found them. So if you want a gall field guide, this is the one that I would recommend. And that's definitely partially due to scarcity. Um, it's, it's a good guide, but it is very biased towards California, Oregon, and Washington. Um, fortunately, a lot of galls are pretty wide ranging and a lot of, you know, a lot of the Great Basin kind of habitat is included in those states as well, but it's definitely not perfect. Um, but I would say it's probably one of the best place to get started. So here's my citations and quiz time. So uh, we did a quiz, we did like a quiz bowl last week for our meeting. So I thought it'd be fun to make up my own. So it's gonna be based on the talk. I'm sorry, I didn't tell you there was a test, but there is. <laughs> so question number one, what forms these hackberry galls? A, aphids. B, silids, C, adelgids, or D, athelarids. And I can't see anything except for the talk, so someone tell me when it's over, when everyone, just, just put your answers in the chat. So yeah, Carrie, okay, if, if everyone, when everyone has their answers in, you, you wanna just let me know so I can keep going. Okay, uh, I will have, I will have uh, Vicky help with that. Okay, sounds good. Or we could just move on to the next one and then compile them all at the end, however you envisioned this. Well, the answer is on the next slide, so. Oh, well, that <laughs> won't work. Yeah. Um, wait, all, most of the only... answers are D, it looks like. Okay. All right. Well, if you answered D, then you were right. <laughs> This was a bit of a trick question because we had a question on this goal last time and the answer was silids, which you know is, is basically right, but it's not up to date with the taxonomy. So just a little quiz. Now you guys are professional entomologists and you know you know what an aphilard is, which makes you pretty special. <laughs> All right, next question. This is kind of a practical theory kind of thing. Um, you are walking in a coniferous, and this is also a true story, by the way. You're walking in a coniferous forest on a mountain in Idaho and you find a strange gall on a willow. You cut it open and find the following larvae. This gall is an undescribed species, but will, that will not stop you in your new amateur cessetologist knowledge. What group of gallers likely formed this gall? 
A, Cicidomyidae, gall midges, B, Cynipidae, gall wasps, C, Typhridae, Typhridids, or D, Aeophyidae, gall mites. And this just happened to me <laughs> two weeks ago in the mountains. I'm seeing a lot sand. of A's. People are saying A. All right. Midges. If you answered A, then you were right. And you now know that anything that's going to be orange inside a gall is going to be a gall midge, which is, you know, they're, they're honestly one of the easiest groups to ID because of that character. But yeah, thank you guys for listening to my talk. That's all I got. I wanted to say thank you so, so much, Samuel. This was utterly fascinating. I've seen many of these galls out on rabbit brush and sagebrush and willows and I had kind of thought, well, you know, that might be a gall, but no idea of the gall formers, the different structures. And so I feel like you've done a really excellent job of giving us this base of knowledge for us to at least have, you know, a good start and understanding about galls. And I just really, really appreciate it. Carrie, Thank we you. have a um, few questions for Samuel. Before yes, question, was, I actually just, I just remember one thing I want to say. Um, okay. Certain spiders will like glue a bunch of leaves together and some moths will do that too. I'm sure you guys have seen that. And sometimes that will look like a gall. A lot of times on sagebrush that'll happen. So also just like try to pull them apart with your fingers beforehand. If there's like web in the middle, then it's usually a spider egg sac or a moth larvae. Because some of those look like galls. We have a lot of people asking questions there were, uh, as you were giving the talk. So I can, we can do one of two things. I could read the question, you could answer, or you could just read through the chat and answer as you um, choose. Yeah. OK. Um, you can read them, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, at first, at first, they're making jokes, which, you know, I mean, Roger, he's like totally hilarious. He says you have a lot of gall. <laughs> Somebody, somebody else That's, is like, oh, groan, don't encourage him. Yeah, Carrie, I don't think you need to be on screen share. <laughs> oh, I need to be on screen share? No, I, I think you're on screen share and shouldn't be. Okay, I'm going to stop. I'll stop sharing. Oh. There. Yes. Okay. Um, I'm actually, do you mind if I just go to the bathroom real fast? <laughs> Are we we will pause <laughs> I'll, I'll be back. I have a, a I have some announcements to make. Any, okay, okay sounds good. <laughs> so, for those of you that are uh, members of our chapter, uh, I sent out an email with a whole bunch of announcements of fall happenings going on, and at the very bottom was voting for current officers. And so, um, if you have not. And if you would like to, you can certainly go in there. We would appreciate your feedback. We'd like to hear about if you're happy with your officers. And so um, go in there and vote. It's really simple, Google form link. And then you just check if you want the current one or if you have uh, someone that you wanna put in as a new recruit. We have had a couple people offer to get newly involved with our chapter. So there's that opportunity too, if there's something you think might interest you and you want to be more involved with the chapter, please reach out to us. You can email pahove.chapter at gmail.com. Did someone have a question? Everyone's good. Okay. I just put in I just put in a question. Uh... Carrie, okay. I, I don't know what's going on with something and I thought Samuel might be able to share some insight. What a okay. great talk, what a great talk. It really was, it really was. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the questions um, or and comments. So um, Barbara confirmed what you were saying, Samuel, and that Idaho is the only state that does not have a native oak but there oh, may wow. be some English oaks around here that you can find. So that was at the beginning of your talk. Um, one of the questions from Gypsy was, besides being part of the ecosystem, 
on which all species depend, do plants derive any benefit from the insects that form galls on them? Um, I mean, you know, there's so many different gall plant relationships. I, the one that comes to mind is figs. Um, the, the fruit of the fig requires the gall wasp. So it, basically that whole thing with figs and the wasps, that's basically a gall forming inside the, the um, so that cyconium, zirconium, is that what it's called? But that's one example where the gall formation process has co-evolved with a plant to actually be part of the reproductive life cycle. So um, that's the first thing come to mind, but like in our area, I can't really think of anything. Okay. Um, Roger commented that turkeys like to eat hackberry galls. Do you know any other animals that feed on galls? I know that birds generally do feed on a lot of them. I know that they'll eat those uh, willow apple galls with the soft flies inside. But aside from birds, not really. I don't know of any others. There probably are. One of my friends told me a long time ago that you can eat the sagebrush sponge galls. I don't know if that's true or not. I wouldn't try it. <laughs> <laughs> so when you're collecting, how much of the plant do you need to keep the gall former alive? Is it just till they reach maturity? Is it just that gall, that structure itself, that gall? You don't need to keep any other twigs or leaves or what have you in there? Yeah, so I mean, usually I just collect the gall, but obviously the nutrients will stop flowing after a certain point. So that's part of where that timing comes in because you do have to kind of get it when the gall has the gall form has already mostly completed its development. Otherwise, it's just going to die and starve. So that's why you usually don't collect them during summer. Um, I never really thought of just like collecting a larger part of the plant, like a whole stem or something. Like if you if you kept the whole thing alive, then that might be that might work pretty well um if you could like take a willow cutting and like grow that with the goal on on it but otherwise yeah you just kind of have to time it when the former is mature okay um next question from rachel is what factors determine monothalamy i'm probably saying that incorrectly and poly in the galls yeah, so usually it's dependent on the species of galls. So a certain type of gall inducer will almost always form either a polythalamus or monothalamus galls. Um, there's weird examples to that, like the sagebrush sponge gall. Um, when it gets lumpier, when more parasitoids come into it, that gall is actually monothalamus normally, but the parasitoids will actually create their own chambers to live in. So it will become polythalamus in certain conditions. But usually it's just based off the species. So like um, rab the, the beaked, st the stem beak, gall and willow, that's always gonna be monothalamus. Okay, uh, let me look here further. Um, a lot of um, comments on the talk and how informative and intriguing it was. Um, a lot of appreciation for you as a speaker. Um, Dr. Mansfield, Don, I will always call him Dr. Mansfield because he was my botany professor that got me excited about plants. So <laughs> he will always be Dr. Me. But anyways, he found a gall midge on the roots of a, oh, I'm going to mispronounce. How do you say that? Ochra puberula. It's a little mustard. Okay. 20 years ago and identified by someone at UC Santa Cruz, he thought at first that was a nitrogen fixing nodule, not previously known to be nitrogen fixing, but put it into, analyze it and uh, put it into acetylene reduction and sure enough it did. What the heck is going on? So you found a gall or you just found a midge larvae like on the yeah. outside of the root? I found uh, what, what looked to me like a nitrogen fixing nodule, which in a mustard would be unheard of. And so I sent it off. I, I, put, I sent out to a chat group of nitrogen fixers and they all said I was crazy and I had to do much more technical analysis. And one guy said, hey, that sounds pretty weird. And he came up and we went out in the field and he took some samples back and they identified it as a a gall midge on roots. You mentioned that there are um, galls on roots and I, I found one and that was so weird, but I don't know why, I don't know what's going on with that. What, what, what's with root galls? 
and and why might I have seen some nitrogen fixing? It might have been just some some contamination in the soil bacteria or something. But, but what's going on with root galls? I mean, they're just kind of like every other gall, as far as I know, just a way for the insect to find a place to live and grow without anything else bothering it. As for why a certain species would develop on roots versus other parts of a plant, I don't really know. Um, I know a lot of these like underground gall formers, like the adult, the adult midge will actually like burrow into the ground a little bit to reach the root or sometimes it's the larvae that goes down in there. But I've actually never, I've never actually heard of anyone finding a midge gall on roots. That's pretty interesting. Yeah, that Is would that be a fast. That would be a fascinating one for somebody to follow up on. Yeah, definitely. I uh, yeah, that sounds super interesting. Because you because you, you know you wouldn't it? think a flying insect would go down underground to lay its eggs. Right. I mean, I've, I've definitely heard of it before. I've just never met anyone that actually found one. And I think that they're you know not super uncommon, but I think they're just so like you know hard to see because they're underground in the roots that people just don't encounter them a whole lot. Hmm. Uh, there's a there's a thesis for somebody who wants it yeah i wish i had time to do that thesis it sounds pretty cool <laughs> <laughs> is that a native mustard or is it a weed yeah something? yeah it's a native mustard in, a, in its native habitat i've never heard of that I'm gonna look it up. i've only seen it once out in the middle of nowhere in malheur county okay so is it like a waihi kind of thing yeah it's out out in the um why he uh sort of out in the west little why he in, in southern mouth oh, yeah. it's weird looking huh i think i've seen this before all right is there any other questions <laughs> sorry well that was the last question so it was a good one to contemplate um i also wanted to say that um we cannot meet in person or as of yet. Um, we might have a speaker towards the end of the season that we would like to bring in in person and people could attend if they chose or they could watch um, online. But um, we had such fun with the trivia that we're gonna try to do a little bit of that each time and then offer a prize. So anyone who answered correctly, we're gonna draw at random from tonight and you'll get a prize. And we have um, we have a variety of things that we could offer um, and I'll, we'll reach out to the winner and see what they're interested in. But um, we have everything from gift cards to, you know, guides on milkweeds and um, native like gardening. Um, we have, can we share my screen real briefly, um, Vicki? Um, we also have books, you know, if you have any, um, well, I don't know. Yeah, you we... should be able to share your screen right now. Yeah, okay, here I am. Okay. Uh, oh, oh, but can you see what I'm showing? No. No. Right. <laughs> oh, okay. Anyways. Take off your a... virtual background. Oh, but then you're going to see my filthy, like, bedroom and piles <laughs> of laundry. I can't do that. Okay. So it's like botany in a day. It's a very, very, very useful book. Um, then that same author has uh, Quest 1 and 2 Botany Adventures for Kids. We have botany card games. As I mentioned, we have gift cards. And so if you're the lucky winner tonight, we'll be reaching out to you and ask, you know, we have books. We'll, we'll be reaching out and asking what you would like for your prize. And stay tuned for next um, presentation and more chances to win. Thank you all for a good night. Do you want to announce the winner right now? Thank you. People Sarah. still on? Thank you, Sam. Yeah, if you've calculated that, sure. Do we know, Vicki? Uh, no, sorry. We'll send it out. We'll send, we'll send it out. out an email. But we'll Hopefully check the everyone chat. Is, is in our email and we can reach out to you that way. So anybody who responded in chat will be eligible to win the prize, except yes. for board members. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Samuel. Thank you, Samuel. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Bye. guys. Thank you. Good night. Thanks. Everybody take care. Fantastic talk.